Do you remember the night that the servants of the high priests uh, arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? You remember the scene and them coming into the garden and surrounding him and his disciples. Now, there was an incident that took place then, and I'd ask you to look at it with me, loved ones. It's uh, John 18 and 10 through 11. John 18 and 10 through 11. It's page 942. John 18 and 10 through 11. So the high priest's uh, followers had surrounded the disciples and Jesus. Then in verse 10 of John 18, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? Now what was the cup which the Father had given him? Well, if you see that, you'll find it in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, where he had explained it carefully to Peter long before that incident took place. Matthew 16 and verse 21, it's page 851, 851, Matthew 16 and 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. So Jesus knew that God had a plan for his life. And he was determined to drink the cup of that plan to the last drop. But Peter rebelled against the whole plan and felt, no, Jesus, don't die. Stay alive as long as possible and liberate the Jews from the Romans. And so Peter rejected the plan that God had completely and was determined to ensure that his plan would be executed by the strength of his own strong right arm. And that was the situation in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, loved ones, that is sin in the flesh. That is sin in the flesh. Independent action by ourselves on the basis of our own needs for self-preservation, absolutely independent of what God wants, and using our own power to bring it about. That's sin in the flesh. You you remember, we came across it last Sunday, because in, in Romans 8 and verse 3, it says that God sent Jesus... And he destroyed sin in the flesh in Jesus. Now, sin in the flesh is just Peter's action in the garden. It's action and attitudes within ourselves that are motivated by priorities of the body's need for self-preservation and self-gratification independent of God, what God wants. I think some of us who are activists are prone to say, ah, that's it. Sin in the flesh is action, and today's study, walking in the Spirit, is doing nothing, leaving it all up to God. Well, no. You know Jesus did plenty. I mean, he healed lepers, and he rebuked the religious leaders, and he carried his own cross, and he turned over the tables of the moneylenders. 
So walking in the Spirit is certainly action. But sin in the flesh is action that is motivated by our own selfish desire for things, for pleasure, for power and influence. That's what sin in the flesh is. It's action and attitude that is independent of God, that is for our own benefit, and is motivated by the old body's need for things and for pleasure and for security. That's what sin in the flesh is. And really, that's what God is opposing in Jesus. And going back to last Sunday's verse, some of you may say, well, I mean, why did he destroy sin in the flesh? Well, maybe you should look at that verse, because... Some of us weren't here last Sunday, and maybe you should uh, get the continuity for today's uh, study. Romans 8 and 3, dear ones. Romans 8 and 3, it mentions this sin in the flesh. Romans 8 and 3. For it's page 982, 982. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do. Sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Some of us may say, well, going back to that verse, I mean, why did God have to condemn sin to destruction in the flesh? Well, the answer is that we men and women had been operating that way for so long, over so many centuries, that we have actually managed to twist our own personalities so that they only work that way. That's it. Somebody comes at us with a sword, we take out our sword and cut the ear off. We've been operating that way so long that our personalities have become twisted and forced into a rut whereby they always work from the body's fear mechanism or the body's need for security mechanism, or the body's need for comfort and pleasure mechanism, work from the outside in all the time. It's been going for centuries like that. Do you remember what happened with Cain and Abel away at the beginning? Cain and Abel were two brothers. They brought two sacrifices to God. But God judged that Cain's heart was not truly penitent, and Abel's was. And so he refused Cain's sacrifice. Old Cain, you know, kind of casual-like. Would you like to come out into the field with me, Abel? And then, just takes out his sword and kills his brother. And then when God says to him, where is your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? So that was from that early stage. But loved ones, the whole race has been operating that way for generations. So much so that we have developed personalities that are twisted so that that's the way they automatically operate. So that we try to do what God wants us to do, but our whole personalities have been rutted into that kind of activity for so long that they are now hopelessly reversed and perverted, and the only way God can give us any chance to do what he wants is to destroy that old reversed personality completely. Find the same line again, you know, and you'll see yourself in this one there uh, with uh, Jacob. You remember Jacob and Esau? You remember Jacob had conned his brother Esau out of his inheritance as an elder brother. Then years later, he heard that Esau was coming with many, many men to meet him. And so look at Jacob's action. If you look at it in Genesis, and it's 32 and verse 11. Genesis 32 and verse 11. That's about page 28. Genesis 32 and 11. And first, you see, he tries to do it the way God wants him to. He prays. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and slay us all, the mothers with the children. So he did make the effort to do the thing right, to go to God first and say, Lord, I did the wrong thing in regard to my brother. Will you protect me now? But it's like ourselves, you know. We say a prayer, and then we think, well, we'd better stack the deck the right way anyway, just in case the prayer doesn't work. And you get it in Genesis 32, verse 13. 
So he lodged there that night and took from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and uh, colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses and 10 he-asses. These he delivered under the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servant, as usual, you know, our own system becomes highly complicated. Pass on before me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? And you can get our old system in it, you know, we're always manipulating. And every time we manipulate, everybody has to say just the right word, you know. Don't tell them it this way, tell them it that way. To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these before you? Then you shall say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. That's sin in the flesh. Not necessarily doing anything wrong. Sin in the flesh is not necessarily murdering people or committing adultery, or committing fornication, sin in the flesh is just acting independent of whether there's a creator or whether there is not a creator, independent of what he wants for my life or what he doesn't want, but acting on the basis of the old body desires for pleasure, security, and power over other people. That's, loved ones, what sin in the flesh is. And the truth is that we as a human race have been acting that way so long that our personalities are hopelessly twisted into that direction. And so for God to get us to operate the other way, he has to first of all deal with this miserable, twisted, perverted personality. And you know, I, some of you know the, the diagram, but it's a fast way, I think, of reminding you of it. But that was the way our personalities were supposed to work there. And it was God's plan that we would always operate that way. We would operate by praying to him as Jacob tried to at the beginning and asking God what he wanted. Then he would give us the life of his Holy Spirit in communion with him and would, through the intuition of our spirits, guide us as to what we should do. And then our conscience would constrain our will on the basis of that guidance and direct our mind and emotions so that they would understand God's will for us. Our emotions would experience the joy of doing it And we would pass it on through our bodies to the world and express it through our bodies to the world. And that was God's plan for us, that we operate that way. Now, of course, we kept rejecting that. We kept acting as Cain did on the basis of security or jealousy or pride, on the basis of Jacob, uh, his fear of his brother, on the basis of Peter, let's get our own way, the way it's our own judgment is right in this instance. And we began to operate the personalities the other way completely. And so we began to be dominated by our minds and emotions. And they in turn were dominated, of course, from here by the needs of the body. And we began to concentrate on doing things that would give us enjoyment, that would give us control of other people, that would exploit our flesh and give us a sense of thrill in that area. And so our whole personalities have been reversed and perverted. Now, that's why God destroyed sin in the flesh. He took our whole personalities, put them into Jesus, and destroyed that old personality there. And that's really what that means. That that was the way we operated. And God took that personality that operated from the outside in, from the body and its desires and its needs and its necessities, and put it on the cross and destroyed it, and raised us up as a new personality. And that's what God has done. What we shared last day was that God has done that with every one of us. He has destroyed sin in the flesh. He has destroyed that old personality that worked the wrong way around. In other words, really, he took Peter's old desire to retaliate. Immediately somebody attacked him. And he put it into Jesus. And even though Jesus could have at any time called millions of angels to his aid. Yet when the Roman soldier put the spear into his side, he accepted it and refused to retaliate on the basis of the needs of his own body and the desire of his own mind and emotions to protect himself. And in doing that, he destroyed 
Peter's powerful retaliatory force inside his personality. And so he made it possible for Peter to receive a new personality. And that's what he has done with each one of us. He has taken that old personality of yours that has been used to operating the other way for years. He has put it into Jesus and destroyed it there. My loved ones, here's a question. If Peter just believed that, would he fulfill God's will for his life? That is, if Peter said, Well, I believe that my old desire to retaliate was crucified with Jesus. I believe that. Okay, now, Lord, does that satisfy? God would have to say, no. I destroyed your old, contorted, perverted personality so that you would be able to obey me. It's not enough for you just to believe that I removed this old personality that prevented you obeying me out of the way I have done that so that you will obey me, so that you'll take advantage of the new personality I've given you, so that you'll take advantage of the death of your old self and old flesh in Jesus, and you'll begin to obey me. In other words, the reason I took your old perverted personality and put it into Jesus and destroyed it was to stop you cutting off people's ears. That was why I did it. It wasn't so that you'd carry on saying, as you took the 25th ear off a 25th high priest guard, ah, well, I believe my old personality has been destroyed in Jesus. No, I did it so that you would stop cutting off ears and so that you would take advantage of the new personality that I've given you. Now, loved ones, many of us, I think, have a misapprehension about this. I think many of us think, oh, no, you've got it wrong. Uh, Jesus died to his desire to retaliate against the Roman soldiers. Jesus destroyed my old selfish personality in himself and the perverted drive of my psyche and of my spirit so that I would not have to do it myself. So Jesus fulfilled the law so that I do not have to fulfill it. Now, loved ones, there are people down through the centuries who have been called antinomians. An antinomian, anti, and nomos in law is Greek, uh, is Greek for law. And anti is against the law. And there have been people down through the years who have been antinomians and have said, no, no, Jesus destroyed the selfish drive in himself and obeyed God's law so that I wouldn't have to do it any longer. And they will say, you see, you don't need to do anything. You just need to believe that your old personality has been crucified with Jesus, and that's enough. And you can do what you like then. You can live how you please. Because the important thing is, Jesus has fulfilled the law for you. Now, of course, it, it uh, just contradicts the desire of our own, the ideas of our own logic. But it contradicts also this verse, loved ones, if, that we're studying today. So, Maybe you'd look at it and we could just take it word by word. Romans 8 and let's read verse 3 and then read on to verse 4. It's page 982. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. For what purpose? So that we would not have to do anything else but believe? No. In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's why God did. God destroyed the old carnal reversed personality that we have that has made it impossible for us to obey him. He destroyed that in Jesus in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now an antinomian will read that verse, you see, and say, Ah no, the verse is wrong, the Greek's wrong, the word is not en, in, it is in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled for us. 
No. It's that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. You can't go home and lose your temper with your wife. You can't go home and tell lies about the missed assignment and say, it's okay, Jesus has fulfilled that law for me, so I don't need to fulfill it. The fact is, loved ones, Jesus wants to fulfill the law in you, not for you. What Jesus did for you was to die for you. So that God could take your miserable, perverted personality, put it into Jesus and destroy it there, and make a new beautiful personality available to you that was adapted for God's original purpose of working according to his judgment and by his power. But that's what Jesus did for you. But he did that for you so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in you. I think some of us, you see, who have been brought up maybe under a kind of antinomian teaching, we will react and say, ah, that's work righteousness. You're saying we have to do something. We have to do something. Well, no, not really, loved ones. It's the passive voice, you see. The verb is in the passive voice there in Romans 8 and 4. In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. In other words, I'm right with you. You have no more power to obey God's law after your old self has been destroyed in Jesus than before it was destroyed. You can't obey God's law yourself. It has to be fulfilled in you by the Holy Spirit of Jesus. So it's the Holy Spirit of Jesus that obeys the law, but he does obey it in you. So, you know, you can't afford to say to your mom or your dad, Yeah, yeah, well, I know I lost my temper, but it's okay. Jesus, in some ephemeral place in the seventh heaven, is obeying the law for me, and it doesn't matter what I'm doing down here. Because your mum or dad have every right to say, no, 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 the teaching is that Jesus is obeying it in you. And if he's obeying it in you, it's probable that I'll be able to perceive it. And so, Jesus' spirit fulfills the law in us. But that's the purpose of it, loved ones. That we would express and let Jesus express his obedience to the law through us. And that's why God destroyed that old perverted self. So that the law might be fulfilled in us. Really what we have to do is let him. So it's a wee bit like somebody buying you a new electric carving knife for Christmas. And you put it up on the shelf and you have the old knife and you take it and you just throw it out into the garbage bin and you realize no more sawing. And then you sit there and you say, well, I believe that old knife has been thrown out. And I believe I have a perfectly new knife that will enable me to cut just efficiently and just with absolute freedom and relaxation. I believe it. And you just look at the old roast sitting there and you expect any minute to see it falling into slices. (laughs) And it doesn't matter how much you believe. It doesn't matter how much you believe the old knife has been thrown away and you've got a new knife. If you just keep believing and sitting there, that meat will never be cut. That's one mistake I think some of us make. We say, oh, it's enough just to believe that my old personality is gone. It's not enough. You have to take advantage of the new personality that is there. On the other hand, there's no point either in getting the carving knife down, sticking the knife in, and going to it. Just sawing back and forward the way you used to in the old days with the old knife. Because it's just going to be as hard as ever. There's no point in doing what you used to do to get the meat cut. And yet you do have to do something. You don't have to do what you used to do with the old knife, but you do have to do something. You have to flick the switch. So it's not right to say we don't have to do anything. It is right to say we don't have to do what we used to do. We don't have to saw that old meat the way we used to. But we do have to flick the knife. Otherwise, the power that is available there will never do its work as it was meant to. And loved ones, it's the same with us. 
You're dead right if you're having trouble obeying God. You're dead right when you say, I can't, I can't. You're right. Your old personality has been so used to acting from the outside and from the needs of the body inside that unless you get rid of that old selfish reverse personality, you won't be able to obey God's law at all. But the important thing to see is, once you believe that it has been destroyed and that there is a new personality available to you in Jesus, then you do have to flick the switch. You do have to let the Spirit of Jesus begin to run your life. So it's right you don't have the old legalistic concentration on every jot and tittle of the law to make sure I don't go wrong here, I don't go wrong there. You don't have to legalistically try to fulfill the law like that. But you do have to do something. You have to let the Holy Spirit of Jesus begin to operate in your life. And that, of course, often means letting him express love through your body to somebody else instead of exploiting somebody else's body for the sake of your own. It does mean that you have to often be content with experiencing just the joy of letting Jesus' life flow through you. And stop looking for more and more enjoyment from circumstances and situations and other people. It does mean you'll have to be content for your mind to concentrate on understanding God's will and God's plan for you instead of using your mind to control and manipulate other people for your own purposes. So it does mean letting the Spirit of Jesus flow through you. And that means rejecting once and for all the old reverse personality that has been crucified with him. And loved ones, do you see how you do that in Romans 8 and verse 4? In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's how you flick the switch. By walking not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. By walking not according to this direction from the outside in, but according to this direction from the inside out. Beginning at last to give up concentrating on the law and obeying it and avoiding sin and begin instead to pay attention to this dear new friend that is inside you called the Holy Spirit. And when he tells you to speak, to speak. When he tells you to turn, to turn. When he tells you to be silent, to be silent. And to start listening to him and running your life by this Holy Spirit. And then one day you'll glance around and you'll suddenly find to your surprise that the just requirements of the law are being fulfilled in your life. And you never thought about fulfilling them. You've just been so busy concentrating on this Holy Spirit. Now that's God's plan for us. What I'd like to spend the next seven weeks doing is talking about how to walk after the Spirit and not walk after the flesh. But that's the secret, walking after the Spirit. That's how to come into victory and deliverance. So will you think, loved ones, of some of those things and Just see if there has been some misunderstanding in your own mind or some deception that Satan has brought. And just get it straight in your own heart so that we can really get down to business, you know, these next couple of months and talk about how to walk after the Spirit and not walking after the flesh. Dear Father, we thank you that you have done all in Jesus' death that needs to be done. But we thank you, Lord, that you did it so that you would be able to see your law fulfilled in our lives. So that our friends would be able to meet people who are kind and gentle and loving and understanding. People who are free from that jealousy and anger and critical resentment. 
So, Father, we trust you now to make it clear to us that you have done everything that was needed to change our personalities. And we can afford to trade that old personality in now for the new one that you have given us in Jesus. And Father, we know that old personality has been crucified and done away with forever. And we know that this new one will work only as we follow this dear Holy Spirit that you have given us. So Holy Spirit, we would give ourselves to following you and walking after you in these coming days. And we know that incidentally, as a result of that, we will end up fulfilling the law. Dear Father, we trust you to make all these truths real in each one of us in these coming days. For Jesus' glory. Amen.